This is Dr. Matt Barber of Alabama Orthopedic Clinic. We are proud supporters of Ransom Reprogram, Ransom Ministries, and all of the good work that they do in our community. If you would like to learn more about us, check us out at alortho.com or barbertotaljoint.com. You can also hear more from me personally on the Ortho Real podcast. Thank you again for allowing us to be involved with Ransom Ministries and all of the great work that they do. Hey, welcome to the Ransom Experience. My name is Matt Armbruster, Executive Director of Ransom Ministries. You're going to hear stories from people that we've served and people that serve alongside us, as well as those that we partner with throughout our community. You're going to hear about decisions they made throughout their life and things that happened through different avenues of their life that caused them to go down a path that they didn't see themselves going. And then also those decisions that they have to make on a daily basis to stay away from those decisions that they made in the past. Ransom Ministries empowers people to utilize their God-given gifts and talents in their career and for their community. All along the way, we learn how to help those close to us and also maybe even help ourselves. This is real. This is raw. This is Ransom. This show is brought to you by Ransom Recycling, your number one choice for electronic recycling in Mobile, Alabama. Help reduce waste in our landfills by recycling all of your unwanted, unused, and non-working electronics. Ransom Recycling is a division of Ransom Ministries that is helping to put men and women back to work. Check out RansomMinistries.com for a complete list of acceptable items. Drop-offs and pickups can be easily scheduled through the website. Please note that we are not accepting TVs at this time. Ransom Recycling, open 8 to 3, Monday through Friday. Help our planet while helping men and women re-enter the workforce. With every star, we are born again. Oh, in your heart, spend less time in your head. Hey, welcome to the Ransom Experience. I know last week we talked to the team that was here doing mission work and uh over the over the course of this podcast we've talked to people that have been in our program come through it graduated out in the workforce now but also we've talked to people that are volunteers today i get the um uh honor of talking to heather morgan who i know how long ago were you in uh our program heather I was in the very first uh, reprogram class. I believe That's it was right. in 2018. That's right. Our very first one with the Home of Grace. I knew that it was, I thought it was the first, but I wasn't sure if it was that or the second. But I know, so we started that partnership in 2018 where Home of Grace, which is a rehab for women, they bring the, their ladies over kind of in their last month of their program and they go through um, our training for the for a month. And so you were our first kind of pilot program, which has been, I mean, that was, you know, that was four years ago. So we've brought a lot of ladies. I want to say we're close to 400 ladies have come through since that time. Um, So I, I appreciate you coming on today and talk about it. So tell me a little bit about Heather, kind of what, what's your story, your life, kind of where you started childhood all to through your teenage years. Okay. Um, Well, my dad was the pastor of an Assembly of God church when I was a child. Um, My mom and dad, they had like a a gospel quartet that they sang in. Uh, My mom and her sisters and my dad, my mom played the piano and they sang um, gospel music. So we lived um, at the church parsonage um, that was adjoined to the church that my dad pastored. And my mom, she was a stay-at-home mom. She um, she ran a daycare out of our home when I was a small child. So when I was around eight years old, my parents divorced. And so we left um, my dad's church. Um, he left as well. And we moved to, the, to my mom's hometown. I moved with my mom to her hometown where her family um, was. And um, 
during this time, we, we went to church a lot, my mom and I. Like, every time the doors are open, we, we were there. It was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you know, the Bible studies, the revivals, the tent meetings, like all of those things. If, if, it, was, if it was happening, we were there. And um, I guess over time, I just kind of grew resentful towards God. Like, I just, I, I didn't really know if I really even believed, you know, I kind of felt like maybe it was forced on me some, and I just didn't want anything to do with it. So, um, at the age of 13, I started being very rebellious. Um, I was a good student in school. Like I made good grades. It was, it was easy for me. School was easy for me. I really, I was one of those that didn't really have to study a whole lot. I just, I just learned well. But um, at the age of 13, I, I became interested in boys and also started experimenting with drugs and alcohol. And um, so by the age of 16, I basically ran away from my home. You know, I, I hooked up with this much older man and I just left. I just left with him. And uh, we, we were able to... Um, give me a fake ID that said I was 21 years old. And so I started working in clubs at a very young age. Um, you know, um, a 16 year old child has no business in that kind of environment. Um, and I began using very hardcore drugs daily, you know, and um, this, this was the beginning of the road to a very deep, uh, dark addiction for me a life of um, just a life of crime. I, be I became a very seasoned criminal at a very young age. So. So that was when you were 16, 17. Yes. And so you were with this man, you're kind of on your own. You have no parents. Um, do you, would you say that? Um, Cause I know, you know, people say all the time, the preacher kids are the most rebellious. They call them PKs or whatever. But do you yeah. do you think do you know why that I mean because you you kind of said I felt like it was forced on me. Do you think yeah. um, since you were in that position that it may, kind of made you feel like you couldn't mess up, or maybe if you did, then it would you know hurt your family or whatever, and that could be why you like just kind of took off and did it. I mean, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but it kind of seems that um, you were just rebelling because of that because it was kind. I mean, I guess you felt like it was shoved down your throat. Yeah, yeah, and that that's, you know, very well could be the case. And also, I think, too, that, um, you know, um, we have a very real enemy in our lives, and I think that um, people who are doing something in the church are targeted more so. Yeah. You know, what better way to, um, to shut down a, a man of God or a church that's preaching the Word of God than, than to target their children, you know? Yeah. That's so true, and you see it all the time. And, you know, I've been learning a little bit about the, the Scripture in Ephesians that said we do not battle against flesh and blood but against principalities, and that's what i am really been seeing, you know, in my own life. And so that's a lot of it. So as you got into the um, drugs and the crime and working in clubs, when did you kind of first feel like you were you had a problem, like an addiction problem? Um. I guess I, I didn't um, I didn't really see the consequences of my problems until I um, had my daughter, my oldest daughter. Uh -huh. um, you know, at um, I think I was 24 uh -huh. when I had her. I was married at the time, and um, you know, I um, I just wasn't able to function the way that that a wife and a mother. Um, it's supposed to. I um, drugs were just my focus, and I, I needed them to even be able to get up and do um, the things that people do. You know, normally the day to day things. I just wasn't able to do those things without without substances, and it it became very evident to me that that it was a problem. Okay, so um, what what was your first? Like you went to the home of grace, but was that your first rehab you went to? Um, no, you know, I, I've really kind of lost count along the way. Um, I've, I've been trying my whole life to get 
uh, a hold of sobriety. Like, so I, I think maybe if you add up like the times that I've went to detox or the times that I've went to treatment or probably maybe like 13 times. Okay. Um, that's just a rough guess. Like I said, I don't really know an exact number. But see, for the longest time, like I was just looking for something to fix me. Like I just wanted, you know, um, a doctor to give me medicine that would make me stop behaving the way that I was or a group that I could go sit in that would just magically fix me. You know, like I really wasn't looking at the, the things in my heart. I wasn't I was just looking at the drug use. Like if I could in my head, I thought if I could just stop that, then my life would be OK. And and that never worked out for me. Like it wasn't I, I was missing the whole thing. It's like I was looking at it through a straw. I could only see the drugs and the alcohol. But but there was more going on. There was just an ugliness in my heart. Yeah. And and I think that's a that's the problem is that we want, we think if we can just kick the habit that that's going to be all we need to do but really the habit is just a uh, symptom of what really is going on in our lives and that's just something yeah. you use to cover those things up and, and I think that's very wise as you learned but I think it also shows that as you went through all those different either rehab or, or detox or whatever, that your focus was on the wrong thing. It was on getting clean or staying clean and all that. When, when that it really isn't it, you got to heal from the inside out. So how did you start that healing? I know you went to the home of grace and then that's kind of how we met. Tell me a little bit about your experience there, your experience with ransom reprogram, and then we'll talk about kind of where you went after you left here. Um, but kind of tell me a little bit about that. Um, okay. So, uh, home of grace is great. They, they run a wonderful program out there and I, I love the, the women who work there. They're really awesome people and they're genuine. Like they love what they do and they really want to help people. Um, I just, unfortunately, when I went through there, I wasn't really at a place of readiness. Yeah. I thought that I was, but I, like I said before, I was missing, I was missing the bigger picture. And so I really didn't deal with the things in my heart. I just kind of was dealing with it on a surface level, you know? Gotcha. Um, yeah. So when I, when I come to reprogram, like I said, that was the first class in 2018. And I learned some, some really valuable things that have helped me along the way. Like I learned how to, I, I was able to develop my very first resume that I ever had. Um, I was taught about, you know, job readiness things, like just simple things, but things that just, you don't think about when you're lost in drug addiction. Like you don't think about the importance of being on time or giving somebody an honest day's work or being dependable, being honest. You know, um, I was able to um, do like mock job interviews where I got a feel for the kind of questions that people would ask during a job interview and how to be able to, um, to answer those questions in a way that wouldn't be embarrassing to me because honestly at that point in my life I had never done anything worthy of talking about like my life had really just been a train wreck so it prepared me to be able to to have a job interview and not just humiliate myself yeah, that yeah. Was great. so you got those basic skills I remember you uh wanting to on your first interview after you did mock interviews and you had an interview, I think it was with a bank if I'm not from yes. that, that, and how you said how much more confidence and, and you didn't get that job, but you were more confident even in the, in the interview. And I think you realized too, that, that it doesn't matter. Um, if they give me the job, it's still, you know, practice for me to do it. Or, um, I just, I just love to see the confidence. Cause I think you shared with me, you had went to an interview before actually you went through reprogram and you felt like you bombed it cause you really didn't know how to yeah. answer those hard questions. And, uh, I think that's really cool. So after you graduated from the home of grace, what happened then? Um, well, you know, I was, um, I got me a job. I was um, working uh, with the um, senior citizens in their home, um, and, and I loved that job. Uh, my oldest daughter, she moved to Mobile here to live with me, and, um, you know, I was, for one of the only times in my life, was, was doing 
the right thing as far as as my child went. I was trying to, um, you know, to, to take care of her and to provide for her and to be a role model for her. But um, I just I wasn't ready. And I, I went back to for me, it always my relapse always started first with a man, not blaming the man. But I'm just saying that was the pattern for me. It was a, it was a relationship and then it was alcohol. You know, we can easily talk ourselves into, if, especially if we work hard and we're providing, we can talk ourselves into being able to just have a drink. You know, it's okay. I deserve this. I've worked hard. I just want to relax. You know, that those are the kind of lies what we can easily make ourselves believe. And so I just fell back into those those ways of thinking, and um, and it, it just ended in a disaster. So. Uh, you said that about a man. Um, we've noticed, you know, I've been in this ministry for 12 years and I've noticed that, um, that's normally the downfall of both men and women or someone of the opposite sex. And, and a lot of times, you know, it's because of our self-worth. You feel like that's what kind of gave you more of a felt better about yourself at first, you know, because someone cared about you or someone was looking to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's that seeking validation in someone else's attention or, um, you know, relationships can be an addiction. Some of us are just addicted to being in relationships. Like we don't know how to be single. Yeah. And it's mainly because we don't have a relationship with the Lord because, he provides that for us. The, the places in us that are so empty and longing and searching can only be filled by God. And um, until I got to a place where I was really ready to surrender everything to him and to let him start healing my heart, I was just seeking. I was seeking love. I was seeking a good feeling. I was seeking whatever it was, you know, from from a lot of different things and people and it just never works out yeah and that's what we've noticed that you know if they do go back to you know their old lifestyle whatever a lot of times it's you know like you said it's a drink here or i can just go do this and i'll be okay that wasn't my drug of choice you know so i can do this and and you tell yourself those lies but in the end it all comes down to that inner healing and what's going on inside of you. And I think you're right. You're trying to validate things by other, through other people when really the goal is to heal yourself. That's what you have to do. That's the first thing you do. So after that, you got, did you get back into the drug culture, the scene through this, um, this choice, I guess. Um, I never went back to like the club scene or the drug scene. I was a, a at home drug addict gotcha. and it was very much, it was, I kept it a secret as much as, uh, you know, I didn't really have a whole, I didn't have people that I was hanging out with using drugs. I would, I was, I was there with my daughter. I, I wasn't at work. I was at home with my daughter, but I was still, uh, numbing and medicating myself. And, uh, you know, you can hide, things for a while, but eventually it catches up with you. Like you, you can't just be a, a full-time undercover drug addict and, and it not eventually comes to the surface. People are going to know. And that's what happened. That's what happened with me. And it was, um, when it came to the surface for me, it was very, um, bad. Like I, I lost my job and my child, you know, because of my choices. And it was just, um, it was suddenly, I didn't see it coming. It was just a very sudden thing. So you got, so it came to the light. You um, had to make a choice then about going to rehab again. Is that right? I did and, immediately. And you immediately. went to the wings of life. I did. And they're, did. that's a partner of ours as well. And they're great people. So you're there now. You kind of work in there. Um, I do. You're through the program or a part of it. Uh, yes, sir. I've been here for going on 18 months now. Okay. All right. So I, you know, I, I, um, I did their 90 day program and then they have a, they have an extended program. It's a one year long program called their Dove Foundation. Yeah. I stayed in and, and, and completed that program as well. And now I, I live here and I work here. Um, 
experience. I'm also doing an apprenticeship at a hair salon in Mobile. This was an opportunity that, that was offered to me um, that was just, it basically fell right in my lap. Like I didn't go looking for this. It was just a God thing. So I'm doing the apprenticeship three days a week and then I work here at the Wings of Life as well. And um, my life has more purpose today than I feel like that it's ever had. You know, every, every day I get to help people and I get to um, just encourage people and let the, the things that I've been through, the things I've put myself and my family through, they have a purpose when I use it to help others. You know, it doesn't just feel like wasted. It doesn't feel like wasted space when, when I'm able to use it to help someone else. That's right. And, it, you know, it tells, tells us that God is going to take all things and turn them into good. And that's even our bad choices. He can turn those into good if we allow him and we put ourselves out there and we're obedient. And, you know, I know that that apprenticeship out there, you're around re- really awesome, godly women out there as well. Um, I know them well. They've had um, another graduate of ours had actually done an apprenticeship there. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm going to give them a plug while, while we're at it, is Genesis Hair Salon. And she, they're phenomenal people out there. And we're, we're so glad to, that they believe in second chances. They believe in giving people a chance. And I really like um, that you're there. So um, there's some people out there probably listening. I loved what you called that I was a stay-at-home drug addict um, because there's probably many either drug addicts, alcoholics that are stay-home that are struggling. And one thing you said is that it will come to light because you can only walk that fake life for so long before it gets tiring and you can't do it and you forget you know, who you told, who you didn't tell tell or whatever, what you told them and what you didn't tell them. And I think that you're a picture of that, but what you're also a picture of is God's grace and God's mercy and how he can do. So if there's someone, I mean, I know there's someone out there. So what are your goals kind of right now for the future? I know you're there, you're doing this apprenticeship. So kind of, what are you thinking down the road? What, what, what are your, some of your goals? Well, you know, I'm hoping that like within a year, or year and a half, I'll be able to have a a license in cosmetology. But I'm also just, um, you know, walking this thing out. I I need restoration with my family, uh, with my my children. They just, you know, I've I've hurt them a lot and I've I've lied to them. I've abused them and they don't trust me and, and they really don't trust the um, sincerity of my recovery because I've done this so many times in the past and I've always went back. So it's really just going to take me walking it out. Like they just need to see that this is the real deal and that I, that I mean it, you know? And so I'm just hoping for full restoration with them, which I know will come. It's coming. That's right. And so we have get a lot of people download this podcast some people, I mean, I'm sure there's some out there that are struggling. So if there's someone sitting here listening to this podcast right now, maybe in their room or in their home, um, and they're struggling with an addiction, what are something like a something you want to tell them? Um, well, if, if you have breath in your lungs, then there is hope for you. Um, you're never too far gone for God's hand to reach you. And it doesn't matter. Um, how many times you have have tried recovery and fallen. It doesn't matter how many times or how long you've been in prison. It doesn't matter how many naysayers you have in your life. If you've got breath in your lungs, then God has a plan for your life and he loves you. That is that is good. And that that is, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud to have got to know you and see you walk that walk and that you aren't giving up and you haven't given up. And now I see, you know, the, Fruits, you know, we haven't been in contact a lot over those, you know, last couple of years, but I'm, I'm praying that God will open doors for you to minister to people that are going through the same thing you are, but also send people to sit in your chair that you can minister to as well. Once you become a cosmetologist and yeah. I, I believe you'll be the pheno- a phenomenal one and, um, continue in your healing, continue, you know, doing the next right thing. Uh, I've been teaching our group here to live in the is which is I'm going to live in what is not what could be or what was Um, because if I, if I don't, I'm going to miss out on what's right in front of me. 
And I think that you're a, a prime example of that. I know you want to get your kids back and you want to reconcile with that and, um, and work on those relationships. But I think you understand that right now you got to concentrate on what is right in front of you. And that's your healing, your, your, um, well-being. And, and I'm proud of you, Heather, for, um, sharing your story, first of all. Thank you. So, Thanks again for joining us. Um, we, we're thankful for everybody that downloads our podcast, everybody that listens to our podcast. We hope that you'll share this with your friends, share it with people that are struggling out there, share it with people who want to know kind of how to get help or also how to help other people. Cause there's a lot of people out there listening that might have addicted drug ones or drug ones, loved ones that are addicted to drugs or alcohol and you just don't know what to do. So I know, I know what I've learned over the years is just love them, be there for them. Don't enable them, but be there for them as long as they have breath in their lungs, like Heather said. So we hope all y'all out there will, um, again, listen, tune in, share this with you, share, follow us on social media. Go to RansomMinistries.com to find out more about what we do. And we thank you again for joining us today, and we will see you next week. Too many days in the darkness Without a glimpse of the light Running tired and broken and scared But I swear I'll never give up the fight With every stop